A very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us on Economic Forum, where we discuss all things relating to the economy. My name is Farai Gwaze. Today, we'll be looking at all things related to young entrepreneurs, the youth in economics, how they've managed to fit themselves into the trying challenges that the economy does face, but at the same time, looking at some of the opportunities that have presented themselves. We always do appreciate your interaction during the course of the program, so feel free to get a hold of us on our WhatsApp platform. That's 0719 Seven double four or zero double seven four five zero two four four three. You can also follow us on all social media platforms at Economic Forum Zimbabwe. Today, my guest is a Mr. Marvelous Nyangoro, um, who also has taken him, taken himself rather uh, through a whole lot of steps uh, towards finding opportunities and addressing the issues of a student student housing. Marvelous, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Fry. Now, Marvelous, you are a young graduate um, who, um, at twenty four years, has a seen an opportunity to be able to capitalize, if I could put it loosely, uh, on student housing. Tell us a bit about how you found yourself in that particular space. My entrepreneurial journey typically began in 2018. I had failed to secure on-campus accommodation and I traveled to school uh, two weeks prior so that I could try and find a decent house. The process itself was not easy and I ended up resorting to an agent I found on Facebook who happened to be my friend. Uh, we actually became friends. After making my payment for him to secure a house for me, he disappeared, like he completely vanished from the map. So it was out of that disappointment and anger that I got, I just decided to start something because I was also on the ground in Gweru. I just decided to start something, you know, to give students access to information so that nobody could have to go through what I had to go through. And that's typically how the journey began and it started building traction. I started missing lectures and people knew me as the sun hat or the accommodation guy. And from then on, I decided to register it as a formal business and actually formalize the way I was doing business to bring about a certain level of professionalism, to build trust amongst the landlords and amongst the student community. So, so far from your engagement with this particular area, what are the challenges that a student accommodation, uh, that you've discovered that student accommodation is presenting so far? The biggest challenge that exists within the student accommodation space is information, like access to authentic and reliable information on both the behalf of the landlord and on the side of the student. On one side, you've got a student who's looking for a certain type of property. Um, probably you want a property that has Wi-Fi, a property that has um, student amenities that fit within your budget and then on the landlord they want a certain type of student um, who can also fit within um, the culture or the rules that they have set for their own property and then you also have the parent again they're worried about where their child is going to stay they want to see the sanity of the place so all this gap that it's, it's just creating a sphere of confusion amongst um, the ecosystem itself. And then that's where these um, bogus agents are taking advantage of, you know, because people do not have this authentic information. And um, also it may be on regards to the landlord is um, property management itself, like how to properly manage a student accommodation to student standards. Mm -hmm. That's also a challenge that landlords are having as well. I, I do want to take a closer look at some of the standards that um, do come into student accommodation, but if you don't mind, let's just go back to um, um, the conditions that universities themselves have to meet to be able to avail accommodation to students. Um, you find that most universities have got uh, students raising into the tens of thousands, mm -hmm. yet the uh, capacity to be able to accommodate may be in the low thousands. Um, so then whose responsibility is it to ensure that students have accommodation? Is it on the university itself? Is it uh, expand from there? The Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education um, and Zimche as well, they've actually come up with a policy and they come up with a document. The document sets um, a guideline in terms of um, what the university, the requirements that the university is supposed to is supposed to have if the university cannot accommodate all of the students on campus. This document also just guides and sets a standard on off-campus accommodation to say landlords are supposed to meet this certain criterion. However, from my experience over the past number of years, no one has actually been following up on these standards that have been set by the ministry. Universities also have their own standards that they've set for off-campus, 
But in most universities, local universities, no one again is actually making a tight follow up to say, are landlords strictly following up on this standard that was set? So would it be fair to assume, based on your assertion, that the universities themselves are not having a direct engagement with off-campus accommodation to ensure that the students are being adequately housed? Um, some of the universities are having, the, the ones I've interacted with, sure. they are having a direct interaction with, um, with um, the landlords. For instance, I'll give an example of Midland State University. They actually do take inspections every beginning of the semester and some houses actually get shut if they're not meeting a certain standard. Mm -hmm. And then there are some universities that are actually not following up right. on that standard that was actually set. Right. And this has created chaos mm -hmm. in the student housing ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So do we find that off-campus student housing accommodation can be made available through liaising with the university or it can be done independently? Um, it can be both. Okay. It can be done through liaising with the university. I know, for instance, Africa University actually takes the step of going out off campus and securing the houses for the students. So the university is responsible for securing off campus for the students, mm -hmm. and then it brings in the students. And then with the other universities, the majority of the universities, it's being offered independently by landlords. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Now let's talk a bit more about the opportunity that you said you found. You then discovered that you could engage directly with landlords and uh, make accommodation available to students. So bogus landlords. Tell us a bit about how that comes up and how people could be able to avoid uh, engaging bogus landlords. Each university has a standard and each university has a criterion that they have that they want the landlords to meet. And every landlord is required to register with each university's Department of Student Affairs. Mm -hmm. So first red flag number one is a landlord who's not registered with the Department of Student Affairs. If a landlord is not registered, that means the university has no know-how about that landlord. They do not they do not exist in terms of the university sphere and they are not recognized by the university. So for each student, if you actually find that this landlord is not registered with um, the Department of Student Affairs, that's a big red flag. So what we do is we actually approach the university first and then we secure a database of registered landlords and then we then make and compile a list of this is our mapping, these are the landlords we're going to target. It's easier to approach landlords who are registered with each university as opposed to approaching landlords who are not registered. And then landlords who are not registered, we encourage them to register first with the university if they want to engage with us. Because we're typically acting as a bridge. We want to, um, we want to get rid of that confusion. We want, we're now, we've now put ourselves in that space of following up on that standard of accommodation okay. that has been set by the ministry. Okay. I will definitely look forward to at least speaking a bit more about uh, the housing hub. Uh, still after this short break, we'll be right back with more on the Economic Forum. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the second segment of Economic Forum. My name is Farai Gwaza. And as per usual, focusing on all things relating to the economy today, we're talking to a young entrepreneur, Mr. Marvelous Nyongoro, who will be sharing with us, or well, has been sharing with us rather, a few interesting insights around uh, student housing. Now, tell us a bit about um, the actual platform that you created. I do understand that it's an online application, it's an online tool. Um, and tell us a bit about some of the mechanics and how it engages uh, with uh, students and landlords. So the Housing Hub is an online marketplace for students accommodation what we do is we list properties that are available for student accommodation and then students can actually students and parents can sift through available properties if they find a property that they like a property that matches their budget a property with the amenities that they like they simply place the booking once the booking has been accepted they have to make a payment and once the payment goes through they get a virtual receipt and you're good to go okay now um, I'm really hearing about payments and uh, virtual receipts one can't help but also uh, uh, consider at what stage does one get to the point where they're actually being able to now, as you say, make a payment? Like walk me through the process. So the first thing is you get on the platform, you sift, you search according to the criterion of the property that you want. You've got various filters. You can search by city, you can search by location, you can search by university. Let's say you search by university, you're a student from National University of Science and Technology. You go through the properties from the National Science and Technology, you find a, product, a property that matches your budget, you see the pictures, you really like the house. You place the book button. When you place the book button, either it can be automatically responded to or it can be manually responded to depending on the settings that the landlord has put up for his property. Mm -hmm. If the booking has been responded to, you will then get a quotation. 
the quotation will break down for you just how much of the rent you have to pay throughout the semester mm -hmm. and how much is the, the deposit that you have to pay at that particular point in time for you to secure the place. And then you click on the pay now button, it takes you to a pay now portal, you make your payment, you get your receipt and you're good to go. Right, now also looking at the relationship between the students and the university, uh, and I, I'm appreciating that you become a conduit uh, for the, 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 the landlord. How then do you ensure that um, one, students for example, are safe within the environment that they're staying in or that they meet the guidelines of uh, the universities? What we've done is the first and foremost stage is we approach the university department of student affairs and then we get a list of pre-registered landlords. These are the landlords that we first approach to because it is easier for us to deal with landlords who are recognized by the university as opposed to landlords who are not recognized by the university. We approach landlords who are not recognized by the university and encourage them to be registered to the university if they want to deal with us. And then on the side of um, the landlord, how we safeguard the landlord against students, for instance, who default against payment of rentals, we get into an agreement with the university. The agreement, for instance, that we have with MSU, if a student defaults paying rent, we will simply take that and send a debit note to the university. The university will debit the student's fees account. Mm -hmm. And then the rental will then start reflecting on the student's account. Right. And you will not be able to see your result until you settle your debt right. for off-campus. Because at the end of the day, it's one ecosystem. Okay. The university, mm -hmm. off-campus, housing hub, and the student, we are one ecosystem. And mm -hmm. therefore, we have, to, we have to correlate and live to hum together harmoniously. Okay. Um, also looking at uh, some of the concerns that may come up, um, so if an individual student wants to be able to access um, accommodation, right, but at the same time may not be in a position to present well, relevant information, for example, for their registration having been cleared, mm -hmm. um, there are a few academic challenges that come up that are bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. How then do you work around those particular components? We have what we call the guarantor policy. Mm -hmm. So the guarantor policy is whereby a guardian or a parent signs themselves up to say if my student, in the case that my student defaults paying rent, mm -hmm. I will be the one who will be able to step in and pay their rent. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And if you are behind on, for example, let's just say your university fees, does that also affect your accommodation situation as it would the internal ones? No, it internal would not. Housing, or it's it, it, separate it's, altogether? It's separate, gotcha. it's separate. Our policies are a bit different from on-campus accommodation right. because with off-campus with on -campus accommodation, mm -hmm. you have to fully clear your fees, you have to be mm -hmm. clean, it has to be a green card throughout. Right. But then with off-campus, we understand that there are those challenges that come around you could be behind your fees but then you also being right. behind your fees did not necessarily mean you can't exactly pay your rent right. but this um, this measure we took it in the instance that the semester is through you haven't paid up and you haven't sent a report or a request you know a letter to say I'll be able to own up my arrears by this period of time you've just vanished and you've disappeared and we have no way of trying to communicate mm -hmm. with you we can't reach you and you're not responding to our emails or you're not responding to our agents in that instance only do we take that action right now tell us a bit about um, some of the challenges that you've had rather when it comes to uh, dealing with landlords and also dealing with students and ensuring that um, you can offer either one of the two an efficient service <laughs> this is an interesting one um, the first major challenge uh, we've had with, was actually dealing with landlords. I think it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset shift for both the student and the landlord. You're bringing in a new technology into, um, into an, an environment where people are used to doing things traditionally. Um, you're trying to tell landlords that you can now um, access all of the things you're doing. People don't have to call you anymore. People don't have to text you anymore. This is a system that, you, that will bring everything into one convenient place. Um, it was really difficult to convince people to accept the technology. It still is, but people are adopting. Uh, I think we also have COVID to thank for that. Mm -hmm. People are seeing that online is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then maybe another challenge we had is caretakers and uh, middlemen. So there are some landlords who are based, let's say, here in Harare, and then they have properties in Gweru. So they usually have a caretaker to manage the property there in Gweru. So this, what then happens is landlord agrees that the rent for the property is $50 per head per month. Right. Caretaker goes on to charge $70 per head per month. Coming in with our system, we're transparent. We can't put $70, which is a bogus rental fee for the month. We will have to put the $50 that, were, that was agreed and known by the landlord. So now we've sort of like rubbed off an extra income source for caretakers who are based in and managing, remotely managing these properties for the landlords. And sometimes landlords do not even know what's going on on the ground, you know, to say, um, 
We've sent our agents for a property inspection and condition report. There's so many number of broken lights. There's so many number of broken windows. Students are complaining about this. And yet a caretaker would have told the landlord everything is okay. So they were really a challenge for us and they still are because they try as much as possible to block us from actually communicating directly with the landlord and even getting the contact of the landlord in the beginning. All right, so challenges indeed. We'll take another short break and we'll be right back with our final segment. We'll be looking at all things relating to student housing right here on Economic Forum. Stay tuned. Welcome to the final segment of our Economic Forum where we're discussing all things related to the economy. Today we're focusing on the young entrepreneurs with a specific focus rather on uh, student housing. I'm joined in studio by Marvelous Nyongoro. Now, um, Marvelous, you've um, expanded and shared at great length um, how you managed to develop a business out of a needs assessment. And um, I guess if I could um, appreciate it, it was from a challenge that you went through and uh, you um, took it upon yourself to be able to capitalize uh, uh, of that. Now, um, tell us a bit about how far-reaching um, the, the business itself has gone, from where it started um, in the Midlands where you were, and um, how far have you expanded? Apparently, we are between three universities. We are in Midland State University itself and Jishawani campus. I won't exactly count Jishawani because it is still part of Midlands. Mm -hmm. And then we're also now just serving Blawayo and Chinoy, in particular focus with Chinoy University of Technology and National University, National Science uh, University. And our team has typically grown with the expansion. We've also realized we need to recruit more and hire more. Before um, lockdown actually started and we had to we had grown our team to about 20 student agents. So we use a student agency model. These students are responsible for negotiating with landlords. Then they're responsible for performing the inspections, taking pictures and putting them up on the site. We had about 20 student agents, but unfortunately we had to cut that number. And now we're only left with 12 youth and um, they get paid on a commission basis. They register properties, they do the inspections and then they get paid on a commission basis. And then the team is actually made of five permanent employees okay. who are working full-time on the project right now right right and some of the challenges that you're finding with growing um opportunities too okay there are challenges and opportunity mm -hmm. with 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 growth i feel like um the biggest challenge we probably had was insufficient market research um it was an assumption a wrong assumption to say what we did in Gweru would automatically work in blaio mm -hmm. there's so many things that we discovered would not work and methodologies even in terms of approach to say the way we're approaching landlords in Gweru, the way we're approaching landlords in Chinoy, totally different environments, totally different institutions, different cultures, and therefore there are certain things that we had to then revisit within our model and re-adopt. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunities that I'm also seeing in there is partnerships. There are organizations and banks that are um, taking interest in student accommodation and I really feel like um, Given the platform, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate with them and bring sanity in the student housing ecosystem. Right. When you say bringing sanity to the student housing ecosystem, um, help me understand a bit more about how you want to address um, the insanity okay. <laughs> that is there. I'll give you. I'll give you a very good, a very good example that most students can actually relate to out there. A lot of students end up settling in most of these homes not because of choice, but out of desperation. So many houses, the carrying capacity of a house, a single property, <laughs> a single unit, mm -hmm. could accommodate as much as forty students. You have five students staying in one room, crowded. I'm not, I'm not talking from the top of my head. I'm talking about what is happening on the ground. Some students stay um, four students within a room, other students stay in five. And as a student, I feel like you also need your personal space. At times you need your personal space. Student wants options. If you want to stay, I feel like if you want to stay in a room of five students, it should be out of an option to say, I want to stay with my crew. Mm -hmm. It should not be the only option that is there. So that insanity that's there and also bringing in, factor in the fact of bogus accommodation agents who are manipulating information, giving wrong phone numbers. If there is at least one player who is maintaining that entire value chain, someone whom people have trust in, someone whom people can trust, the parents, the institution, the guardians, 
and there's a responsible that that player becomes a responsible board becomes a responsible eye to ensure that no student is duped off their accommodation students are staying in a place that is secure that is safe that is decent that is neat um, it really brings about sanity within that space itself. What's your appreciation of the current position around addressing um, the challenges student housing is, ex is, ex is being experienced at a national level through the ministry? I really appreciate there has been interest over the past one and a half years. There really has been interest around um, student housing and bringing sanity. I would want to commend the government on taking action. I know that right now, um, the International Development Bank of Zimbabwe is building one of the most world-class exquisite platforms at the National University of Science and Technology and I would really commend them for that effort. So the government really has been taking action in terms of student housing. They're seeing that there is a gap mm -hmm. and there is a need and the action needs to be done because it's an issue that has been prolonged for so many years and I really feel like now they're taking the action right. that was supposed right, to be right. taken. Yeah. And I also appreciate that for all your work you've also managed to uh, guide one of the accolades of a young entrepreneur. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so in 2000, in 2000, and end of 2018, I feel like that's when we got the first, that's when I got the first award that I ever got. It was from UNICEF Zimbabwe. I was named amongst uh, the top five um, startups for the year for the UNICEF Generation Unlimited contest. And in 2019, I received the Startup of the Year Award from CBZ Holdings. Uh, in the same year, again, um, I was our business was voted Startup Business of the Year at Founders Live International Competition. And then sometime in August, I was nominated for the top 20 youngest entrepreneurs in Africa by MasterCard Foundation and the African Leadership Academy. And then recently, two days ago, I, was, um, I came out second place in the Harvard Business School Africa New Venture Competition mm -hmm. that was held for startups across Africa. All right, and what's your take on being able to um, have um, achieved that level of recognition for having been given bogus accommodation? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, it's it's something that I it's something that I didn't think I, I didn't see myself at this stage mm -hmm. um, to having been saved. Um, I'd be getting all of these awards because when I got in, it wasn't about the awards. It's never about the awards. It's really about just creating impact and changing lives and bringing change, the change that I actually want to see to say no student actually has to be bogged off their money. But just receiving these awards also just gives me, um, it gives me the hype uh, and reminds me that I'm on the right track, that I'm doing the right thing. And I would really hope that all youth in Zimbabwe would just, you know, just start from wherever you are with whatever you have just start just keep on pushing and we can become the change that we want to see so in closing marvelous um where do you see yourself um taking the business in growth in terms of the future of it in essence i see a lot of potential for the housing hub and not just potential for expansion within the student um, housing space, but there's also potential for us to explore other housing markets, uh, becoming a real estate company that people can really depend on because we've been doing market research and we've seen a gap within the real estate, the general accommodation space, you know, Finding accommodation is still a challenge for everyone in Zimbabwe and we really also just want to explore and just grow the housing hub beyond the student. After a student graduates, then what happens? Do we just let them go? We want to work, your, we want to work with you, your life journey with you and become your housing partner for your entire life. Truly ambitious and I can uh, uh, see you being able to at least charter your software in that particular area. Marvelous, thank you so much for joining us and we definitely do look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Thank you so much for having me on the show. We're joined by young entrepreneur, Mr. Marvelous Nyongoro, um, and uh, we'll definitely be sharing more information on that. But you can also follow us on our social media platforms. Uh, that's uh, Economic Forum uh, Zimbabwe. Feel free to also let us know more of your contributions on our WhatsApp platform. That's 0719104744 or 0774-502443. My name is Farai Gwazi. Stay tuned for more pleasant viewing.